Hello everyone, my name is Laurel Griffith. Welcome to Sunday School. We are continuing in our study of Romans and today we'll be, we'll, we will be in chapter 10. We have learned that the Apostle Paul has been building something of a theological treatise in this letter that he is writing to a church that he did not establish, but that he hopes to visit. It's a church that is uh, a combination of both Jews and Gentiles, and he is writing to explain to them what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ and how salvation comes by our faith in Jesus Christ. And so he builds this logical argument or this logical um, explanation. And at the end of chapter nine, he tells us that um, there is no there is no reason for anyone to be ashamed in the final judgment when they have placed their trust in Jesus Christ. And this idea of no shame is connected to the idea of fear, that there is no reason for anyone to stand in front of the judgment seat of God and have fear in their heart if they have put their trust in Jesus Christ, if they have, if they have believed that their salvation is brought to them by faith in Jesus Christ. So he transitions now into um, the verses that we see in chapter 10 and he is lamenting the fact that the Jews have failed to make this decision. The Jews have failed to see this and in, in this that salvation in this way. And um, so he is appealing to them to understand that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. So we are going to read verses one through twenty, uh, one through seventeen. But we'll read a few and then uh, talk about it as we go along. So let's take a look at. Chapter 10 of Romans, verses 1 through 4. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they might be saved. I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So the first thing we recognize is that Paul is talking about having zeal, zeal for God. Now, zeal for God is <clears throat> a wonderful thing it, when and if it is accompanied by a knowledge of God. And if you recall, when Paul was uh, before his conversion, before his Damascus Road experience, Paul characterized himself as having zeal for God but he was ignorant of the grace of God and he had no knowledge of God. And so his zeal led him to go house to house and to pull people out who professed to be Christians and to have them arrested. His zeal for God led him to hold the cloaks of those who stoned Stephen to death. So zeal for God without knowledge of God is actually a very dangerous thing. I think it's interesting to reflect on zeal that zeal is uh, held up as being something of great value when zeal and experience with God are together. And, and if you take that and think about it a little more deeply, you understand that it, if you have an experience with God and a knowledge of God, but you have no zeal for God, then there is nothing that will be accomplished. There will be no change made in the world if all of those who believe in Jesus Christ and who have an experience with Jesus Christ, but fail to have a zeal for Jesus Christ, then the world will not hear of Jesus Christ. So this it's this combination of experience with God, knowledge of God, and zeal for God that Paul holds up and says this is valuable. So he says that the Jews have had no zeal, have had zeal without knowledge. And then he contrasts um, the righteousness of the Jews with the righteousness of God. This is, a, this is tricky for us to understand um, unless we get a grasp on this word that is translated in our Bibles as righteousness. The word here, the Greek word, carries with it a, a variety of meanings and it can be translated as uh, justice of God, it can be translated as God's plan of redemption. So the way God has chosen to redeem and rescue the world from the effects of sin. A biblical scholar N.T. Wright translates this word as the covenant 
faithfulness of God. And sometimes he translates it as the covenant justice of God. So it's the idea that this is the way God has established that he is going to put the world to rights. This is the way God is going to redeem the world. So when you see righteousness, it is God's intent for salvation. So the Jews, Paul is contrasting the Jews' righteousness, the way they see salvation, and the way God sees salvation. And so the things that we need to recognize is that God sees salvation, or God has determined that salvation is always going to be through Jesus Christ. And it is a free gift of God, a gift of grace, and we are able to receive this gift of grace when we place our trust in Jesus Christ. When we believe, when we have faith in Jesus Christ, then this salvation is made available to us. This is God's righteousness. This is God's redemptive plan. Now, in contrast, the Jews have a plan or an, an idea of what righteousness looks like. And they believe that in order to live in any kind of relationship with God, they have to obey the law. So they see this as when they keep the law, then they are able to live in relationship with God. So they have inverted the order. They, instead of saying that relationship comes first by grace through Jesus Christ as we place our faith in him and then we become people who want to keep the law and are able to keep the law because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, they are saying that we keep the law in order to earn God's favor and approval. And so these are the, these are the two contrasts, but it goes even um, beyond that because Paul says, not only are the Jews, um, do they believe that they have to earn um, God's favor, earn salvation by keeping the law, but they also believe that this is an exclusive opportunity for them. They do not see that this offer extends to anyone else in the world. And so what Paul is saying is that, no, this grace is a gift from God and it is open to whoever will place their trust in God. So he is contrasting right here in these verses that the Jews have a perspective and it is not God's perspective. God's righteousness is salvation is available to all who will receive and place their trust in Jesus Christ. So he also says in verse four here that Christ is the end of the law so that all of the law that was given in the Old Testament and all of the prophets that have written and proclaimed uh, wh what God's plan is all lead up and point to Jesus Christ. So everything that is explained and written and proclaimed in the Old Testament finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at verse five. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is of all and is generous to all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, these verses are familiar to many of us, <clears throat> but I think that we have uh, probably have a, a very basic understanding of what Paul is talking about unless we have done some uh, work of looking into the Old Testament because Paul has saturated these verses with Old Testament references. And so we are going to talk about several chapters, several verses, Deuteronomy 28, 29 and 30. We are going to refer to Joel chapter 2 verse 32. And then in the next section we will we were going to talk about an, a passage out of Isaiah. 
Paul is saturating his, um, his treatise, his explanation with Old Testament references and thought because he is writing to a people who, um, who are using the Old Testament as the way to live. It is their scripture. It is what they know and it is what they believe. So he takes, he takes them where they are and then he lets, helps them to view the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ. And that is a great way for you and I to think about our Old Testament study. Anytime we take the time and we should take the time to investigate the Old Testament, to spend time reading the Old Testament and reflecting upon the Old Testament. We do so through the lens of the cross, through the lens of Jesus Christ. So to properly understand what Paul is saying here, we have to get a glimpse of Deuteronomy and there's three chapters and it's chapters 28, 29, and 30. The quotation that Paul is, is giving us is from chapter 30, but you have to set it up by going back even to 28 and 29. Now in chapter 28, well, first of all, Deuteronomy is a book that was uh, is actually a record of Moses' sermons that he is giving to the Israelites at the end of his life. They are at the they are at the border of the promised land. They are ready to move into the promised land. And Moses is very old. He has led them throughout their time of, of uh, crossing the Red Sea, wandering in the wilderness to Mount Sinai, and then wandering the wilderness, and now all the way <clears throat> up to the promised land. And so he's giving them this review backwards and this look forward in these sermons. And in chapter 28, Moses gives them these instructions and says, you have to make a choice. You choose to obey and worship the one true God. You choose to love the, the Lord your God and follow his way, and God will pour out blessings upon you. But if you choose to go after the gods of the culture, then there will be curses that you experience. And these curses are going to be that you will be dominated by the nations around you that you will experience the same suffering that the Egyptians experienced with the plagues. And you are also going to be dominated by the, the uh, foreign nations and the cultures around you. Now, of course we know, well, in, in chapter 29, then Moses comes and says that it's a, it's a prophecy. He says that I believe or I know that you are not going to be faithful to God's covenant with you and that you are going to be a rebellious and sinful people and you are going to go after the gods of the culture. And because of that, you are going to experience this, uh, this punishment or this isolation from God. God is going to remove his hand of favor from you and the nations of the world are going to dominate you. And then in chapter 30, we come to this very hopeful and beautiful chapter that's just saturated with all kinds of meaning where Moses says, but for the grace of God, but because of God's grace, when you repent, when you cry out to God, he will hear you and he will forgive you and he will restore you. He will bless you. He will enrich your life and you will be able to experience this relationship with God once more and the blessings of God because you have repented of your sin and you have called out to the grace of God. Now these verses that Paul is, is saying here, who will, who will ascend into heaven, that is verse 6, and who will descend into the abyss. Paul is essentially saying, Moses has said, has, he's quoting Moses here, and Paul is saying that there is no reason to ascend into heaven because Christ has already descended in his incarnation and come to you. And there is no reason to look for God's favor across the sea for God has already raised Christ from the depths of the earth. God has raised Christ from the grave. And so there is no reason to search anymore for the favor of God because this is all available right here in Jesus Christ. And so Moses is going back and using this passage of Deuteronomy. Now, the interesting thing to me about chapter 30 in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy from a historical standpoint is that the Jews spent a lot of time reflecting on this chapter because they saw this as God's promise to restore them. And they believed um, that if they kept the law, 
that then God would restore them and they would be uh, they would be the ones that would be in power over the other nations of the world. And they would be the ones who would be able to control their own destiny, but also have the authority over other nations. And they saw this as a return to King David's rule. And so they believed that if they kept all of the laws and they and they had a consistency in this, that all the people of the land kept the laws, that God, this would usher in the Messiah, God's anointed one would come and he would rule as King David had ruled. So you see, they have taken the, the current Jews in the first century when Jesus has been preaching and teaching and now when the apostle Paul is, is sharing the gospel, these Jews had this perspective that all of this um, blessing in favor of God depended upon their behavior. It depended upon what they did and how they lived and not only for themselves personally, but for their whole nation. And that's why it was so concerning to them to have any kind of lawlessness or any kind of rebellion against what they perceived to be God's truth or what God had been saying in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. But what Paul is showing here in this very skillful way he uses these Old Testament arguments is he is saying that no, this is not something that is contrary to Jesus Christ, but actually this is what Jesus Christ has done. Jesus Christ has fulfilled this prophecy. Jesus Christ has brought people to God through his own life and death and resurrection. And so they are now reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And there is no fear of the judgment. And there is no longer any struggle to try to keep the law, but rather it is this idea that they will live in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. This is God's great plan of favor. This is God's plan of redemption and rescue. And this is how they will receive the blessings of God, but not only for themselves, but also for all who will believe, all who will say that Jesus is Lord. So here we see in verse nine, that if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So Paul, most likely, most scholars believe that what Paul has in mind here is the Roman insistence that all people say that Caesar is Lord. Now you remember um, that Rome in, in dominating, the, uh, dominating the, the cultures around them or the, the countries around them did not care how many gods and goddesses you worshiped. In fact, they thought it was great if you had a community that worshiped the local gods and goddesses, the idols of your particular community. But everyone had to declare that Caesar was the, the premier God, that Caesar is Lord. So when Christians refused to say Caesar is Lord, that's what put them at odds with the Roman government. And so at the baptism, at their baptism, as Christians, as, as Jews and Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ, they would believe in their heart that Jesus Christ was the way to salvation, that Jesus Christ had died and taken their sins upon himself. He was the atoning sacrifice for them, for their own sin, and that he was the way to have relationship with God because of his, the forgiveness that was offered through Jesus Christ and they would believe that in their heart. They would trust Jesus for their salvation, and then they would say, Jesus is Lord, which is a declaration of their faith. And Paul is, is writing here to say, this is what faith is. If we confess with, if we believe in our heart and confess with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Verse 10, for one believes with the heart and so is justified, and then one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. So then this next verse, uh, verse 11, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. So that idea that we mentioned in chapter nine, at the end of chapter nine, and then here comes he comes back to this at chapter 10. No one who believes in him will be put to shame. That means no one who believes in him has any fear in the final judgment, that they will be able to stand before God with confidence, not because they have earned their salvation or their, or, or, 
or anything about them that merits salvation, but rather know they have placed their trust in Jesus Christ. And so they are able to face God with confidence and without fear and without shame. And then in verse 12, this beautiful verse, Paul emphasizes there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who calls on him. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And verse 13 is actually a quote from Joel, which is chapter Joel chapter 2, verse 32. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this, this verse is included in the passage that Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. When Peter preaches about the Spirit is going to come and is going to be um, on, on all people who have received Jesus, um, that this verse is contained in that passage. So it's the idea that the Spirit is a, it comes and indwells each person who has received Jesus and all of those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile. Salvation is for all people. So Paul is making a firm statement that the, that the Jewish listener and reader cannot miss. Salvation comes to them because they have placed their trust in Jesus Christ alone. He continues to develop this idea in verses 14 through 17. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all have obeyed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. All right, this is just some beautiful and probably fairly familiar verses to you. Paul here is quoting from Isaiah 52, 7. And I'll just read this passage to you because it's, it's good for us to go back and see where this is in the Old Testament. So Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So Isaiah is uh, in his prophecy is writing that there is going to be a time when there is good news that is proclaimed. And this news is going to be news of peace. It's going to be glad tidings. It's going to cause such a celebration because um, all people are going to be able to understand that God is the one who reigns and they receive their salvation through um, through this uh, Messiah who is coming. And of course, Isaiah is writing about something that's happening not only then at the time that the Jews will be delivered from exile, but also he is pointing forward once again to Jesus Christ. And so Paul picks this up and says, this is the good news. This is, these, this is the, what we are celebrating. These are the beautiful feet of those who are bringing the good news. And the good news is that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Jesus Christ opens the way to salvation through your faith by God's grace. And that is that is all that is required. It, it, it is the idea that you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ and it is not of works. And this is what they are celebrating. But Paul is saying that this news comes because they have heard the gospel. So let's, let's go back and look at this. It's really stair steps if you look at this. How are people going to call on Jesus Christ if they have not believed in Jesus Christ? And how are they going to believe in Jesus Christ if they have never heard of Jesus Christ? And how are they going to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ unless someone preaches to them and brings that gospel to them? And how are they going to preach unless someone has sent them? Now, Paul is saying that the Gentiles have heard are beginning to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the proclamation of the gospel and that they are beginning to come to Christ because someone has been sent, someone has preached, someone, those people have heard and because they have heard, they have believed. 
And so there are those who are coming to Christ because this has, has begun, that the apostles are taking the good news and they are seeing the fruit of this as the Gentiles respond. Not all are coming. There are some that are coming, but some who are not. And Isaiah, he's quoting Isaiah here, but not all have obeyed the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So some believe and some reject. And Paul says some of the Gentiles are believing and some of the Gentiles are rejecting and many of the Jews are rejecting. So Paul is saying this is the way the message is proclaimed and travels to all, either Jew or Gentile. It is the, it is the result of being sent the result of the proclamation of the gospel, the result of hearing that good news, and then belief comes from hearing. So it all began, it goes back to being sent. So as I've been pr preparing this lesson and, and contemplating this beautiful passage of scripture, it's so many layers here for us. Um, something has come to my mind, and perhaps it's because this is where I have been for the last few months in a class, I've been taking a class at Asbury on preaching. And in this preaching class, um, the professor has caused us to read and to think together about what, the, what actually preaching is designed to do. And the idea um, that he has expressed and that the writers of the textbooks have expressed is what Paul is saying here. And so let me share personally just a minute as we close out this lesson, what I have learned and been thinking about. And that is that the preacher comes um, to the congregation from within the congregation. The preacher is not someone who is any different than those who have, um, have gathered for worship. The preacher is one who has also come to faith in Christ um, and has, has a relationship with God that is made possible because of what Jesus Christ has done for them on the cross. The preacher goes to the word of God on behalf of the people of God. And the preacher meditates and studies and contemplates and hears from God through his Holy Spirit. And then the preacher brings the message brings the message that God has laid upon their heart that is re, that is based in scripture. And, and that comes as a part of this worship gathering where we come together and hear the word proclaimed. And when the word is proclaimed, the message is delivered and presented. And those who are present have the opportunity to hear. The listener is able to hear the message delivered, but it is the work of the Holy Spirit who is the one that helps the individual and the congregation together to discern the message for them. The preacher delivers is the vehicle, but the Holy Spirit is the one who does the work and the transformation. And the Holy Spirit is the one who, who helps the listener to hear and apply to their own lives and to the life uh, of the community of faith. And then the congregation is sent out into the world. And that sending forth is where they are to carry the gospel message that they have received out into the world. And only when the congregation responds to what they have heard and carries this message to the world has the preacher's message actually produced fruit or been effective or reached its full potential. It is the opportunity, the responsibility of those who hear the message proclaimed to carry the message out into the world by what they say and how they live that shows the world what this message is all about, that communicates to the world what this message is all about. And that is when the sermon is completed. The sermon is never really fully preached until the congregation then turns and takes the message that they have heard, this good news of Jesus Christ, and communicates it to the world around them. So as we contemplate this beautiful passage of scripture and all that Paul has, has told us here, I think it might be valuable for you to think and reflect upon and perhaps discuss in your Sunday school class, what gets in the way of a congregation who hears the message to be able to then turn and to take that message out into the world? 
What are the obstacles? Is it obstacles in hearing? Is it obstacles in preparation to be able to hear? Is it obstacles of what we encounter in the world? Is it a different expectation that we might have that this is not really our responsibility? Um, what are the obstacles that prevent us as members of the household of faith from hearing the message that is brought to us uh, through the Holy Spirit and what it prevents us from being able to go and to share that message by the way we live and by the things that we say. And then maybe the flip side of that discussion is what are our opportunities? Where are we able to live this out? Where are we able to proclaim what we have heard with our lives and with our words? And what, what might God, what opportunities might God open for us if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, and if we understand our role in bringing the good news of the gospel of peace to all people. You know, I think as Christians, we pray for those who will hear the call of God and who will respond to this call and be willing to uproot and to leave and to take this message to different cultures and different places, to places perhaps where the gospel has not yet been proclaimed. And we, we support them with our finances, we support them with our prayers, we invest in our young people in order that they are prepared to hear the call of God. So the church rallies around this as something that is important to us, that we send out. But sometimes we fail to understand that we are all sent out. We hear and we are the ones who have the beautiful feet we are the ones who are to carry the gospel outward into our community. So this is just an idea for you to discuss this week. How is God calling you to take the message that you hear on a Sunday morning and take it outward? And then what are the opportunities, but also what are the obstacles? So I hope you have a great class this week, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless you.